Hi, this is Matt. Today I want to talk to you about the difference between social justice and biblical justice. Volumes could be written on the different historical and philosophical applications of social justice, and we could easily find ourselves lost in a tangled maze of ideologies and nuances. Hence, today we seek to examine the core element of social justice as a current social economical political movement and how it compares to biblical justice. Let's look at some definitions of social justice provided by two proponents. First, Celia Hart, a socialist author, made this statement, we must understand that the only road to peace and social justice is socialism. With the exploiting classes there will never be social justice. Without social justice there will never be peace. Another thought was expressed by William E. Murnion, a socialist professor, who said, it is necessary to understand that every modern theory of social justice is ideological. No matter how reasonable or rational it may be, every modern theory of social justice is the rationalization of the interests of a particular group or class. According to the dictionary, social justice refers to a fair and equitable division of resources, opportunities, and privileges in society. Originally a religious concept, it has come to be conceptualized more loosely as the just organization of social institutions that deliver access to economic benefits. It is sometimes referred to as, distributive justice. A boiling, seething emotion rose from my chest into my throat. An avalanche of angry words tumbled from my small mouth. My anger could not be quenched. A final declaration sounded with thick certainty. When I'm older, I'm going to do something about this. I was only about 10 years old when I said these words, but I had seen enough to know. Gross injust- I, a sensible farm boy, and my grandparents, owners of a small fabric shop in a sleepy prairie town had traveled to the claustrophobic city of Winnipeg the purpose, to visit textile outlets and make purchases of cloth. After two days of warehouses and shop floors, I knew this was the end of the world. Working conditions were deplorable. Too little sunshine poorly chosen paint colors, and smelly old merchantmen. Here's some candy, kid. It tasted stale. At one critical point, Grandma had to silence me. Didn't she know? Didn't anybody care? The lone Pepsi machine we had passed in the darkened hall wore a sign of prophetic importance, out of order. And I was dying of thirst. Yes, the textile industry, indeed, the entire business world, was out of order. How could anybody work in these depressing places? Boredom alone had to be killing people it was killing me. As we loaded up with fabric and left this urban wasteland, I caught a glimpse of something else. A brick-lined smokestack was silhouetted against the evening sky, and smoke, or steam it didn't matter, was belching forth to choke out nature's life. That's when I lost it. Didn't those people know what they were doing? Didn't anybody in the government have a brain? Not only was the city a depressing place and the warehouses terrible for workers, but the factories were going to kill everything. When I grew up, I was going to put a stop to this madness. Others would join in this desire to change the world. We would save the worker from his intolerable slavery and rescue the environment from the hands of greedy merchantmen. Justice, or vengeance, would be served, whether at home or abroad. Grandma soothingly patronized me. Grandpa, lips tight, said nothing. Looking back, I marvel. As a young mind, I had a keen sense of social rights, and liberals and pacifists of Western nations were viewed as important players in the cause of international Marxism. Their importance came not from an understanding of the Moscow Hegelian Marxist program but from their ignorance. Convinced of holding the moral high ground and blinded by a sense of enlightenment, these individuals advanced the communist agenda by acting on the emotion of the ideal. In other words, they were emotionally drawn to a Marxist-oriented, social justice, cause of the, plight of the worker, economic and social inequalities, the desire for class-based justice, and the, struggle for peace. These individuals would then become activists, educators, and cultural trendsetters. And they demanded social transformation that would, invariably, have an anti-capitalist and anti-individualist tone. The boys in Moscow grinned. The only way of assuring lasting peace in the world, from the Marxist perspective, 
explained Bargum, is the elimination of capitalism. Peace, solidarity, and justice throbbed with a Leninist heartbeat throughout this turbulent period. Capitalism, with its emphasis on private property and free enterprise, was considered the prime cause of social strife. Socialism, with its emphasis on community and social order, was the path to progress. This leftist ideology was solidly embedded in education during the 1970s, and from that point on its fingerprints can be observed in practically all major institutional systems, including schools and churches. Retina Ghosh and Douglas Ray, in the preface to their 1987 book Social Change and Education in Canada, provide a short outline of social theories that shaped modern education. This included Herbert Spencer's social Darwinism, the conflict theories of Karl Marx, modernization, and the concept of human capital with its emphasis on workforce development. Each impacted the Canadian school system, as did technocracy and a host of other philosophies. And while the system may see distinctions in these theories, the classroom was far more blurred. Indeed, any of the above, or a mix of all, shaped the student's worldview. But rarely did the student understand the idea behind the curriculum. As Gauche and Ray explained, social change, whether gradual or revolutionary, is inevitable and brings with it new patterns of social interaction. The place of education in this process is both complex and critical. For a young mind in the late 70s bombarded by a host of conflicting educational patterns, the emotional tug attached to exploited social issues seemed the most relevant. No wonder my trip to Winnipeg ended with a Trotskyite call for revolution. What has any of this to do with social justice? Everything. In today's Christian world, and Western culture in general, there's a myriad of changes taking place, and with it comes new language. Social justice is certainly in the spotlight. Jim Wallace of Sojourners played a huge role in introducing the concept to millions of Christians as did many emergent progressive figures like Brian McLaren. Shane Claiborne and a myriad of others with the help of numerous large Christian publishing companies, all seeking to reframe Christianity in a social justice context. Today, the Christian Reformed Church has an office of social justice the Salvation Army has the International Social Justice Commission, and a fast-growing number of Christian colleges, seminaries, and universities now have social justice programs as do many, if not most, denominations and ministries. But where does this term come from? and what is its dominant history. Social justice appears to have been first employed in the early 1840s by an Italian Catholic theologian and Jesuit, Luigi Tapparelli d'Azeglio. As Daniel M. Bell points out in his book, Liberation Theology After the End of History, d'Azeglio's concept was justice as a general virtue that coordinated all activity with the common good. The notion of virtue is important, for it brings a flavor of charity. Tapparelli's vision circled justice as a system of moral norms that included individual rights and the freedom to associate. The greater the whole of the community, the total of individual goods, would, thus benefit. This form of justice was also known as economic justice and looked upon wealth redistribution as a coordination of rights. Direct government administration should be avoided wherever possible, for Tapparelli recognized the danger of centralization. In 1891, Pope Leo XIII issued his encyclical Rerum Novarum, which dealt with the working class conditions, the right to private property, and the workplace relationship. Leo XIII rejected communism and the greed that arises from an immoral application of capitalism, instead advocating that workers and employers should come to an honest agreement regarding labor and wages. At this point, Catholicism rejected Marxist-based socialism. Decades later, Pope Pius XI penned his encyclical Quadragesimo Anno. In it, he denounced communism and at the same time embraced wealth redistribution, the sharing of benefits, as a function of social justice. By this law of social justice, one class is forbidden to exclude the other from sharing in the benefits. While this idea started to stretch the earlier limits of Catholic social justice, he at least recognized that all sides of the class divide could be negative players. The rich withholding the wages due to the worker, and the worker demanding all from the rich. That aside, 
The free market system wasn't an acceptable means to build a civilization on social justice. Just as the unity of human society cannot be founded on an opposition of class S, so also the right ordering of economic life cannot be left to a free competition of forces. For from this source, as from a poisoned spring, have originated and spread all the errors of individualist economic teaching. Free competition, while justified and certainly useful provided it is kept within certain limits, clearly cannot direct economic life, a truth which the outcome of the application in practice of the tenets of this evil individualistic spirit has more than sufficiently demonstrated. Therefore, it is most necessary that economic life be again subjected to and governed by a true and effective directing principle. In reading through the encyclical, an unsettling doublespeak emerges. Communism is chastised, yet the free market is evil. In this dialectic, the result is that certain kinds of property ought to be reserved to the state. The public authority, according to Pius XI, should maintain ownership of enterprises that advance the general welfare. A slide down the slippery slope had now begun in earnest, social justice, would become the excuse par excellence in calling for a global collectivist system. Speaking on Pius XI's views regarding economic justice, Pope John XXIII pointed out that man's aim must be to achieve in social justice a national and international juridical order, with its network of public and private institutions, in which all economic activity can be conducted not merely for private gain but also in the interests of the common good. Furthermore, in 1963, John, this was the era of Vatican II. Speaking of the changes that occurred during this period, Professor Philip C. Baum tells us, it could be characterized as a shift from anti-communism toward pro-communism of a new world order. In 1965, Pope Paul VI made similar comments at the United Nations, openly suggesting the establishment of a world authority. Why? Because a world authority is needed to establish and maintain an international, common good. That same year, Paul VI's document Gaudium et Spes, Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, recognized that the Catholic Church has an important role to play in constructing a peaceful and fraternal community of nations. In that vein, he recommended in Section 2 titled, Setting Up an International Community the creation of a Catholic organ designed to promote international social justice. Individualism was upheld in the document, but it must support the greater good. Communistic collectivism in production was considered erroneous, yet a form of social collectivism was deemed necessary. An excerpt demonstrates this social justice relationship where it says, citizens, on the other hand, should remember that it is their right and duty which is also recognized by the civil authority, to contribute to the true progress of their own community according to their ability. Those who hold back their unproductive resources or who deprive their community of the material or spiritual aid that it needs, save the right of migration, gravely endanger the common good. Here we see a swing far past the earlier idea of a charitable virtue. The implication is forthright. You will participate. In the context of this particular document, that participation includes the demands of a global community and world civil authority. Although Pope John Paul II was perceived as more conservative, he too espoused a globally-minded social justice agenda. This was evident in his endorsement of the UN Millennium Development Goals, which gravitate around wealth redistribution. We should note while the Millennium Development Goals outwardly demonstrate some admirable targets, education, eradication of poverty and hunger, improved health, the methods are suspect. And as the most notable geopolitical pope of the 20th century, John Paul envisioned a globalization of solidarity. In discussing globalization as a unifying factor, he said, for all its risks it offers exceptional and promising opportunities, precisely to enable humanity to become a single family, build on the values of justice, equity and solidarity. Furthermore, the U.S. Catholic bishops, operating under John Paul's reign, were open regarding social justice, the common good, in their 1986 letter, Economic Justice for All, stated, the common good may sometimes demand that the right to own be limited by public involvement in the planning or ownership of certain sectors of the economy. 
Support of private ownership does not mean that anyone has the right to unlimited accumulation of wealth. Interestingly, Catholic commentators from all sides of the political spectrum describe the bishop's document as pro-capitalist. However, a cursory read demonstrates that economic justice for all is pro-socialist. Yes, the individual's responsibility is highlighted and private property is validated. However, it's the bishop's economic justice that displays a different set of cards with its call for collective government-directed programs aimed at curing social ills. Individuals, therefore, are obligated to participate under government dictates. In other words, if you can contribute to the common good, then you must thank you for taking time today to talk about the issue of social justice versus biblical justice. Remember if we pursue social justice, we will go down the road to communism, which is where we are headed today. Get on board with biblical justice. Treat people like God wants us to treat them. Let the parable of the Good Samaritan be our guide. Treat people with compassion but also realize sometimes biblical justice means that we need to have tough love. I hope you enjoyed this video today. This video is the first of a two-part series on social justice. If you would like to see the second part or more videos on today's cultural issues, Go to the Nehemiah Reset website at nehemiahreset.org or go to our rumble.com channel. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Thank you for watching this video from Nehemiah Reset. We hope you found it informative and helpful. Our mission is to assist Christians in developing a biblical worldview as it pertains to relevant cultural issues. We seek to inform Christ's followers, equip them, and mobilize them into action to vote for their biblical values and to actively engage the culture. If you enjoyed this video, Please like, share, and subscribe to our Rumble, YouTube and Facebook channels. You can also visit our website at nehemiahreset.org to learn more about our vision, our resources, and our upcoming events. Thank you for your support and God bless you.